the Mundo Monday. Today we have a very tasty batch of stories for you. There are many things that everyone in the world has in common, and one of them is obvious. Everyone eats. But that's not surprising. All animals and even some plants need to eat in order to live and grow. What's special about humans and food, though, is that humans love to mix up tasty recipes and share them with their family and friends as a way to show they love them. That is the same all around the world. But exactly what kinds of food people have created all around the world depends on what plants or animals grow around where they live, how easy it is to get other ingredients from other places, how much money they have to buy ingredients, what their religions or traditions say about what is or is not okay to eat, and what they have learned from the people who came before them. So people have created all sorts of different kinds of foods. And the more people of different cultures share their stories, the more they also end up sharing their unique foods. As I said last month, I love trying all the many different kinds of foods from all around the world. And some of my favorite, well, most of my favorite kinds of foods aren't even from the cultures of my ancestors except strudel and soft pretzels from Germany. But I didn't actually discover those things through my ancestors, just the same way I discovered spaghetti and wontons and empanadas through all the many kinds of people who've come to America sharing the foods of their homelands over the years. Here's a book about sharing food across cultures. Chick Chak Shabbat. Shabbat is a Hebrew word. You might also hear it translated as Sabbath, but Shabbat specifically refers to a weekly holiday in the Jewish religion, from sundown every Friday to sundown on Saturday, all working stops. You take a day off of all chores, including even cooking. That's why this Shabbat meal is a stew called Sholen which you put on the stove on Friday afternoon and just let cook and simmer all night and almost all the next day. So you don't have to cook on Shabbat, but you do get to eat. And if you live in an apartment building with a generous cholent making neighbor like Goldie here, you'll get to share a Shabbat meal without even being Jewish. Chick Chack Shabbat by Mara Rockliffe, illustrated by Kirsten Brooker. Every Saturday, a wonderful smell wafted from apartment 5A. It curled into 4D, tickling Tommy Santiago's nose as he played his tuba. It slipped into 3C, tempting Signora Bellagalli as she bustled around dusting her teacups. It crept under the door of 2B, tantalizing Mr. Moon as he sat typing his new romance novel. And even the Omar family on the first floor caught a whiff. They sniffed the air and smiled. At last, the door to 5A flew open. Out stepped Goldie Shimcha, her face shining like a silver spoon. Come in, come in, it's Jolant time. As her neighbors took their places at her table, Goldie ladled steaming stew into their bowls. While they ate, they argued about what made Goldie's cholent so delicious. Signora Bella Galli cried, It's the tomatoes! Or, or the barley, offered Mr. Moon. Little Lally Omar piped up, The potatoes! And the Santiago's all agreed, it had to be the beans. But Goldie shook her head. When I was a girl, she said, I always helped my grandmother get ready for Shabbat. All Friday afternoon, we rushed around, cutting up vegetables, sweeping the floor, dressing the table in its best lace tablecloth. Busy, busy, hurry, hurry, do it right away, chick chack. But when the sun went down, my grandma lit the candles, and Shabbat began. For one whole night and day, we put aside the things that kept us busy all week long. 
While the cholent bubbled slowly on the stove, we spent time in a special way, together. I don't celebrate Shabbat exactly as my grandma did, said Goldie. But every Friday afternoon, I do put a pot of cholent on the stove to bubble through the night and day. And when it's done at last, it has a special taste that isn't beans or barley or tomatoes or potatoes. For me, the taste of cholent is Shabbat. And all her neighbors raised their spoons and said, Shabbat! One Saturday, however, something wasn't right. Tommy's tuba played nothing but sour notes. Signora Belligali's nicest teacup tumbled off the shelf and smashed. And Mr. Moon, exasperated, hurled the pages of his latest romance novel right across the room. The Omar sniffed and sniffed, but couldn't catch the faintest whiff. At last, little Lali Omar climbed the stairs and knocked on Goldie's door. Goldie answered, her face buried in a tissue. Friday afternoon, I felt too sick to get the cholent on the stove, she said, and sniffled. Now it's too late. You can't make cholent in a hurry right away, Chick Chack. No cholent for Shabbat? Tommy Santiago dropped his tuba when he heard the news. Signora Belligali's feather duster flew into the air. Mr. Moon got so mixed up he put a monster robot in his romance novel and it squashed the hero flat. On the first floor, the Omars frowned. Poor Goldie, Mrs. Omar said. Just won't be Shabbat for her, Mr. Omar agreed. Little Lally peered into the fridge. Potato curry isn't the same thing as Cholet, she said. Still, it always cheers me up. As the Omars climbed the stairs with their bowl of potato curry, Mr. Moon came out of 2B with a tray. Curry and barley tea, he told them. Of course it isn't Cholent, but... Signora Belligali squeezed out of 3C. Tomato pizza, she puffed. It's not Cholent, but... And then Tommy Santiago held the door of 4D open for his mother. It's not Cholent, she admitted cheerfully, but everyone likes beans and rice. Goldie opened the door for them. She blew her nose, wiped her eyes, and smiled. Come in, come in. Her neighbors took their places at her table and they filled their plates. We didn't have time to make anything special, Signora Belligali apologized. We had to hurry, hurry, bring it right away, chick Jack, but... But here we are, said little Ali Omar, together. Goldie took a bite of pizza, a nibble of curry, a mouthful of beans and rice. She sipped her barley tea. Then she looked around the table, her face shining like a silver spoon, and said, I think it tastes exactly like Shabbat. I'm guessing Goldie did not have COVID. Yeah, it's not really a good idea to eat with your neighbors if somebody is sick right now, but it's always nice to make food for a sick neighbor and drop it off. One thing I love about this story is how everyone brought a food from their own culture that shared at least one ingredient with Choland. We had potato curry from the Middle East, and potatoes originally came from South America, barley tea from Korea, tomato pizza from Italy, and tomatoes originally came from Central America, and beans and rice as a recipe from Central America, although rice, as we learned last year, originally came from Asia. It's a worldwide meal. It's funny how some foods, like rice, spread all over the world hundreds of years ago, but other foods aren't as well known outside their original cultures. In this next book, we have another slow-cooked stew, but it's one that's completely new to the friends of our hero, Bilal. It's a recipe his grandparents brought from Pakistan for dal. Dal are lentils kind of legume bean, but dal, as Bilal loves it, is a whole soupy recipe made from those lentils. Dal 
is common across Central Asia, not just in Pakistan. But Pakistan is an interesting country culturally because it's a mix of the Islamic cultures to its west and the Indian cultures to its southeast. So Pakistani dal is full of ingredients from all across Southern Asia. But most importantly, Bilal is really excited to share dal with his friends. Bilal Cooks Dal by Aisha Saeed, illustrated by Anusha Syed. Bilal is biking outside with his friends when his father steps out of the house. Bilal, it's time to begin cooking dinner, says Abu. Abu, like Baba and Papa. Remember we were talking about all those words earlier this year? Bilal's friends ask why they would need to start cooking so early. This dish takes patience, Abu says. This dish takes time. It's the best meal of all, says Bilal. It's dal. What's dal like? Is it salty? Does it taste really good? Dal is nutty and creamy and warm like soup. They're all different kinds. Come see, you can help us pick which one. They take off their shoes. They wash their hands. Bilal grabs his favorite stool. They study the colors. Yellow, orange, green, brown. Yellow, Elias says, because yellow is sunflowers and rubber ducks in the sun. And Shana Dal is my favorite, Bilal says. When a bull scoops out a cup of the bright yellow dal, it clatters into the bowl. They're small like pebbles, but shaped like pancakes, and they slip through Bilal's fingers like sand. They line up the spices. Bilal breathes in the scent of turmeric, chili, cumin. Morgan sprinkles salt. She looks very excited about that salt. Elias tries to help, but uh, apparently he's got too much there. Bilal combines the spices. Abu pulls out a pot, the biggest they have. It looks funny. Morgan frowns. It smells funny, whispers Elias. Do you think it will taste okay? And suddenly, Bilal is a little tiny bit worried that maybe, just maybe, his friends won't like dal at all. Is it ready? asks Elias. Can we taste? asks Morgan. Uh, no, Abu explains. Dal takes time. We have to wait. The flavors mix together slowly. You kids go play and have fun while it cooks. They run outside to play hopscotch. Elias numbers the sidewalk to 20. L let's make it longer, to 100, he says. It'll definitely be done by then. So they hop, skip, and jump to the end. Caleb and Emma join too. Let's check if it's ready. Let's go take a bite. Not yet, Bilal tells them. Dal takes time. We have to wait. So they put on swimsuits, slip down the slide, and cannonball into Morgan's pool. Elias floats, Morgan dives, some more neighborhood kids join them, and then they all play Marco Polo. Is it all done? asks Morgan. It's got to be ready by now. Blau squints at the sun. It's not as high in the sky. Almost, he tells them. Doll takes time. We have to wait. They hike through the forest and skip pebbles in the stream. The sun starts to set. As they watch fireflies glow, they hear Abu call out, Bilal, it's almost time. They march up the cobblestone steps. They knock on the yellow door, and as loud as they can, they ask, is it done? Come see. Abu smiles and opens the door wider. The kids rush inside. Bilal lifts up the lid. He peeks in the pot. Abu says, ready for the final steps. They dice up the onions, chop ginger, press garlic, squeeze lemons, and top it off with fresh cilantro. Bilal puts out plates. Abu sets out the naan. The kids pull up every chair in the house. 
Bilal watches his friends take a spoonful of dal. It's steamy, says Morgan. Like soup, says Elias. It tastes garlicky and salty and sweet. I like the onions. I like the lemon. And the way it's so creamy, it melts in your mouth. Dal takes time. We had to wait, but Bilal, you were right. Dal tastes great. Bilal looks at his dad and smiles. Abu winks. Tasty, isn't it, he says, like my Ami once made. My friends and I helped her once, like you. Dal is tiny. Dal is tough. But with a little time and a lot of patience, it becomes the softest, tastiest, best thing in the whole wide world. And the best part is sharing it with friends. That's why Bilal loves Dal so much. The end. Dal makes Bilal so happy. You know, sharing foods with friends of different cultures is fun, but there's also something special about eating a food you've always loved, especially when it's not as common to other people. If you're in a new place, far from where you used to live, food from where you used to live can be very comforting. Like the time my friends and I had American corn on the cob in Germany in college. We were only there for a week, but it was still weirdly a treat to eat that very American food after eating all that German food. Now, imagining you weren't just visiting Germany for a week. Imagine you had to move to a whole new country. For good! How nice would it be to eat something from your homeland then? That's the idea Salma has to help cheer her mother up in Salma the Syrian chef. Salma and her mother have just moved to Canada as refugees. Oh, refugees definitely don't move to a new country just for fun. To be a refugee means to be forced out of your home because it's too dangerous to stay there. Salma comes from Syria, a country that has been wracked by civil war for the past 10 years. Salma and her mother love Syria and don't really want to leave it, but nobody wants to live in a war zone. So they had to escape from Syria and then find some place, any place where they could live. Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada is a very different place from Damascus in Syria. Wet instead of dry, cool instead of hot, with a different culture and different language and different foods. And Salma's mother is homesick, so maybe a taste of home can help cheer her up. Salma, the Syrian chef. Story by Danny Ramadan. Art by Anna Braun. Salma watches the Vancouver rain from her apartment window in the Welcome Center. It's different than the sunny days back in Syria. She still can't pronounce Vancouver, but her friends tell her that her ways of saying it are more fun. Vancouver, Selma says to Mama, but Mama's making dinner. Vancouver, Selma rules her R's, but Mama won't look up from her English homework. Vancouver! Salma finally succeeds, but Mama's busy calling Papa back in Syria. Does Mama look very interested in her pronunciation there? She looks sad, doesn't she? Papa will join them in Canada soon. Salma's heart aches like a tiny fire in her chest when she thinks of Papa. She wonders if Mama's heart is burning too. Sometimes when you have to escape from somewhere as refugees, you can't all go together. You have to just hope that everybody will make it out and come back together in time. Mama used to giggle with her friends in the refugee camp. It sounded like they're ringing bells on the older boys' bikes. But now, after a long day of job interviews and English classes, Mama barely smiles when tucking Salma in. Maybe if Salma can make Mama laugh, Vancouver will feel a little more like home. Salma draws Mama a clown balancing on a ball on top of an elephant. 
She tells Mama a knock-knock joke about bananas and oranges that she learned in language school. She even hides behind the fridge. She jumps out and screams, Boo! But all she gets is Mama's sad smile, full of love, but empty of joy. I want to make Mama laugh. Soma rushes into the playroom and almost crashes into Nancy's chair. She's been sad for a long time. When was the last time you saw Mama happy? Asked Nancy in her broken Arabic. You have to remember that this book is written in English so that, that I can read it to you, speak English, and, and you can understand it because you, you know English. But, but it's actually, she's actually saying these words in Arabic. And, and Nancy is helping her learn English, but she also learned to speak Arabic and, so that she can talk to her before she learns English. Anyway, Salma imagines a waterfall of Mama's many sad faces since they left Syria. How about you draw a picture, Nancy says. Drawing helps me when I forget my good memories. Salma looks at the colorful crayons. Her memories of Mama's smile shine like a beautiful rainbow over that waterfall. Salma draws her home back in Damascus. A yellow house with a garden surrounding it like a necklace. The garden had a tree with green leaves and a bird's nest with three little eggs. She colors the living room walls purple. Were the walls really purple? Nancy asks. No, Selma says, but it's okay to add new colors to my own memories. She draws Papa at the table. Mama carries a freshly made dish of wu shami a big smile on her face. Salma can't bring Papa here sooner. She can't rebuild their old home. Suddenly, she knows what to do. I think Mama misses Syrian food, Salma tells Nancy and the other kids. I want to make her full shammy. I miss Kushari, Ayman says. Soma tastes the salty, spicy Egyptian dish on her tongue. I miss the way my mama made masala dosa back in India, Ria adds. Evan misses arepas. He just arrived from Venezuela. But none of them have heard of full shami, and Soma doesn't know how to make it. Do you know how to make full shami? Soma asks Jad, the Jordanian translator who taught her the English names of the flowers in the community garden. Remember we read that book last year that was written by the Queen of Jordan? He came from the same country. No, but I can find a recipe for you, Jad says. His fingers move swiftly on his keyboard, then Salma hears the printer ticking. Jad hands Salma a paper with Arabic words. I can do this she whispers. But then she realizes she doesn't know the English names of any of the vegetables. Salma reads the Arabic words. She's scared of looking silly in this new place where hardly anyone knows her language. The smell of crayon in her hands reminds her. I can draw the vegetables. Yellow for lemon, green for parsley, brown for peas, and red for onion, she sings. And this is chickpeas, and that's garlic, and that's a bottle of olive oil. Soon, she has all of the drawings she needs. Aisha walks Salma to the supermarket, so she doesn't have to cross the street alone. Salma likes Aisha. They play hopscotch in the welcome center, and Aisha brought her home-baked Somalian sweets. Shukran. Salma thanks Aisha as they wait for the traffic to stop. Back at the welcome center, Salma organizes her vegetables on the kitchen table. My mama won't be laughing at all if I use a knife, Salma tells Amir and Malik, who came together from Lebanon. Can you help me chop these vegetables? She blushes when Malik kisses away Amir's onion tears. You ever get onion tears? Maybe if you're cooking with onions. The three of them giggle, until Salma realizes she forgot the spices. Mama likes sumac with her full chamois. Salma looks through the spice rack. Paprika is Papa's favorite spice, and Mama loves cardamom in her coffee. Pepper makes her sneeze, but she can't find sumac. 
Tears fill her eyes. This is the worst idea ever. It's too hard to cook Syrian food here. Salma's fingers shake. The spices get blurry and their smells mix together. Everything is ruined, Salma says between her teeth. I'll never make Mama laugh. I hear you're looking for sumac. Salma feels a warm hand on her shoulder. It's Granny Donya. I miss Persian cooking too, Granny says, handing Salma a tiny red jar. Family dinners back in Iran always made me happy. I'm mad that we had to leave home, Salma insists. I can't find sumac or speak Arabic to everyone I know. Look at all those beautiful flowers and all those blossoming trees. Granny Donya points out the window. This home might be different from everything we knew, but it's beautiful in its own ways. Salma takes a deep breath, filled with the smell of sumac and rain. Her anger escapes a little, like water droplets flying off her hands when she shakes them dry. Salma sprinkles Granny Donya's sumac into the fushami. It is beautiful, she agrees. One final step. Salma holds the olive oil bottle over the bowl, but it slips out of her hand and crashes to the floor. Amir and Malik help her clean up the glass, but they have no olive oil for her to use. And Aisha has never cooked with olive oil before. And Granny Donya's bottle is empty. Salma used all her money on the other groceries, so she can't buy more. She sits on the floor and cries. Salma feels useless, like an umbrella in a country with no rain. She hides her teary face when Nancy walks by. Nancy stops beside her. What's wrong? Everything, Salma says. All I wanted was to make Mama laugh and look at the mess I made. What I see is a dish made with love, Nancy whispers. I don't think it's missing a thing. When Mama comes home that night, Salma blocks her way into the apartment. Don't be mad! Mama frowns. What happened? Do you think Mama's really going to be mad? Salma opens the door. I couldn't find olive oil. On the table, a bowl of full shammy awaits. You made this for me? Mama asks. Before Salma can answer, the door opens again. We brought olive oil, Nancy says. Salma jumps in excitement, and then Mama breaks into a long, sweet laugh like the echo of bells. Mama, Salma says while Mama tucks her in that night, when I'm with you, I feel at home. Mama kisses Salma goodnight. Your smile is my home. That night, in her dream, Salma rides a bike around Vancouver's seawall. She rings the bell and Mama laughs beside her. Around her, all her new friends ride their bikes and ring their bells. Salma feels the sun on her face and looks up to a purple sky painted with the colors of crayon. The dream goes on all night long. It's a very happy dream. There's one thing I definitely want to point out before you go. Um, there's a recipe for cholent in the back of Chick Chak Shabbat a recipe for Chana Dal in the back of Bilal Kutz Dal, and no, there isn't a recipe in the back of this book, Fool Shami. There is a website you can go to that has the recipe for it. Library books are a great place to find new foods to try, so check out one of these or many other food books and make a new food together. Delicious! See you next month. A country that has been wrecked by... That was Mr. Adam, believe it or not, interrupting us.